Yesterday by Haruki Murakami As far as I know, the only person ever to put Japanese lyrics to the Beatles song Yesterday and to do so in the distinctive Kansai dialect, no less, was a guy named Kitaru. He used to bell out his own version when he was taking a bath. Yesterday is two days before tomorrow, the day after two days ago. This is how it began, as I recall, but I haven't heard it for a long time and I'm not positive that's how it went. From start to finish though, Kitaru's lyrics were almost meaningless, nonsense that had nothing to do with the original words. That familiar lovely melancholy melody paired with the breezy Kansai dialect, which you might call the opposite of pathos, made for a strange combination, a bold denial of anything constructive. At least, that's how it sounded to me. At the time, I just listened and shook my head. I was able to laugh it off, but I also read a kind of hidden import in it. I first met Kitaru at a coffee shop near the main gate of the Waseda University, where we worked part-time, I in the kitchen and Kitaru as a waiter. We used to talk a lot during the downtime at the shop. We were both 20, our birthdays only a week apart. Kitaru is an unusual last name, I said one day. Yeah, for sure, Kitaru replied in his heavy Kensai accent. The Lottie baseball team has a pitcher with the same name. The two of us aren't related. Not so common a name though, so who knows? Maybe there's a connection somewhere. I was a sophomore at Waseda then, in the literature department. Kitaru had failed the entrance exam and was attending a prep course to cram for the retake. He failed the exam twice actually, but you wouldn't have guessed it by the way he acted. He didn't seem to put much effort into studying. When he was free, he read a lot, but nothing related to the exam. A biography of Jimi Hendrix, books of shogi problems, where did the universe come from, and the like. He told me that he commuted to the cram school from his parents' place in Ota Ward in Tokyo. Ota Ward, I asked, astonished, but I was sure you were from Kansai. No way. Then in Chofu, born and bred. This really threw me. Then how come you speak Kansai dialect? I asked. I acquired it. Just made up my mind to learn it. Acquired it? Yeah, I studied hard, see? Verbs, nouns, accent, the whole nine yards. Same as studying English or French. Went to Kansai for training, even. So there were people who studied Kansai dialect as if it were a foreign language? That was news to me. It helped me realize all over again how huge Tokyo was and how many things there were that I didn't know. Reminded me of the novel Senshiro, a typical country boy bumbles his way around the big city story. As a kid, I was a huge Kansai Tigers fan, Kitaru explained. Went to their games whenever they played in Tokyo. But if I sat in the Hanshan bleachers and spoke with the Tokyo dialect, nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. Couldn't be part of the community, you know? So I figured, I gotta learn Kansai dialect, and I worked like a dog to do just that. That was your motivation? I could hardly believe it. Right. That's how much the Tigers mean to me, Kitaru said. Now Kansai dialect is all I speak. At school, at home, even when I talk in my sleep, my dialect's near perfect, don't you think? Absolutely. I was positive you were from Kansai, I said. If I put as much effort into studying for the entrance exams as I did to study Kansan dialects, I wouldn't be a two-time loser like I am now. He had a point. Even his self-directed put-down was kind of kansai like So where are you from? He asked. Kansai, near Kobe, I said. Near Kobe? Where? Ashia, I replied. Wow, nice place. Why did you say so from the start? I explained. When people asked me where I was from and I said Asia, they always assumed that my family was wealthy. But there were all types in Asia. My family, for one, wasn't particularly well off. My dad worked for a pharmaceutical company and my mom was a librarian. Our house was small and our car a cream-colored Corolla. So when people asked me where I was from, I always said, Near Kobe, so they didn't get any preconceived ideas about me. Man, sounds like you and me are the same, Kitaru said. My address is Den, Den and Chofu, a pretty high class place, my house is the shabbiest part of town. 
Shabby house as well. You should come over sometime. You'll be like, what? This is Den Chofu? No way. But worry about something like that makes no sense, yeah? It's just an address. I do the opposite. Hit him up right front with the fact that I'm from Den and Chofu. Like, how do you like that, huh? I was impressed. And after this, we became friends. Until I graduated from high school, I spoke nothing but Kansai dialect. But all it took was a month in Tokyo for me to become completely fluent in Tokyo standard. I was kind of surprised that I could adapt so quickly. Maybe I have a Charmeleon type of personality. Or maybe my sense of language is more advanced than most people's. Either way, nobody believed now that I was actually from Kansai. Another reason I stopped using Kansai dialect was that I wanted to become a totally different person. When I moved from Kansai to Tokyo to start college, I spent the whole bullet train ride ment mentally reviewing my 18 years and realized that almost everything that happened to me was pretty embarrassing. I'm not exaggerating. I didn't want to remember any of it. It was so pathetic. The more I thought about my life up to then, the more I hated myself. It wasn't that I didn't have a few good memories. I did. A handful of happy experiences. But if you added them up, the shameful, painful memories far outnumbered the others. When I thought of how I'd been living, how I'd been approaching life, it was also trite, so miserably pointless, unimaginative middle-class rubbish, and I wanted to gather it all up and stuff it away in some drawer, or else light it on fire and watch it go up in smoke, though what kind of smoke it would emit I had no idea. Anyway. I wanted to get rid of it all and started a new life in Tokyo as a brand new person. Jettisoning Kansai dialect was a practical, as well as symbolic method of accomplishing this. Because, in the final analysis, the language we speak constitutes who we are as people. At least that's the way it seemed to me at 18. Embarrassing? What was so embarrassing? Gitaro asked me. You name it. Didn't get along with your folks? We get along okay, I said. But it was still embarrassing. Just being with them made me feel embarrassed. You're weird, you know that? Kitaru said. What's so embarrassing about being with your folks? I have a good time with mine. I couldn't really explain it. What's so bad about having a cream-colored Corolla? I couldn't say. My parents weren't interested in spending money for the sake of appearances, that's all. My parents aren't on my case all the time because I don't study enough. I hate it, but what are you going to do? That's their job. You gotta look past that, you know? You're pretty easy going, aren't you? I said. You got a girl? Kitaru asked. Not right now. But you had one before? Until a little while ago. You guys broke up? That's right, I said. Why'd you break up? It's a long story. I don't want to get into it. She let you go all the way? I shook my head. Nope. Not all the way. That's why you broke up? I thought about it. That's part of it. But she let you get to third base? Rounding third base. How far did you go exactly? I don't want to talk about it, I said. Is that one of those embarrassing things you mentioned? Yeah, I said. Man, complicated life you got there, Kitaru said. The first time I heard Kitaru sing yesterday with those crazy lyrics, he was in the bath at his house in Denin Chofu, which Despite his description, it was not a shabby house in a shabby neighborhood, but an ordinary house in an ordinary neighborhood. An older house, but bigger than my house in Aisha. Not a standout in any way. And, incidentally, the car in the driveway was a navy blue Golf, a recent model. Whenever Hitaru came home, he immediately dropped everything and jumped in the bath. And, once he was in the tub, he stayed there forever. So I would often lug Little's round stool to the adjacent changing room and sit there talking to him through the sliding door that was open an inch or so. That was the only way to avoid listening to his mother drone on and on, mostly complaints about her weird son and how he needed to study more. Those lyrics don't make any sense, I told him. It just sounds like you're making fun of the song yesterday. Don't be a smartass, I'm not making fun of it. Even if I was, you gotta remember that John loved nonsense and word games, right? But Paul's the one who wrote the words and music for yesterday. You sure about that? Absolutely, I declared. Paul wrote the song and recorded it by himself in the studio with a guitar, a string 
quartet was added later, but the other Beatles weren't involved at all. They thought it was too wimpy for a Beatles song. Really? I'm not up on that kind of privileged information. It's not privileged information, it's a well-known fact, I said. Who cares, those are just details, Hitaru's voice said calmly from the cloud of steam. I'm singing in the bath in my own house, not putting out a record or anything. I'm not violating any copyright or bothering a, bothering a soul. You got no right to complain. And he launched into the chorus, his voice carrying loud and clear. He hit the high notes especially well. I could hear him lightly splashing the bathtub as an accompaniment. I probably should have sung along to encourage him, but I just couldn't bring myself to. Sitting there, talking through a glass door to keep him company while he soaked in the tub for an hour wasn't all that much fun. But how can you spend so long soaking in the tub, I asked. Doesn't your body get all swollen? When I soak in a bath for a long time, all kinds of good ideas come to me, Gitaru said. You mean like those lyrics to yesterday? Well, that'd be one of them, Gitaru said. Instead of spending so much time thinking up ideas in the tub, shouldn't you be studying for the entrance exam, I asked. Geez, aren't you a downer? My mom says exactly the same thing. Aren't you a little young to be like the voice of wisdom or something? But you've been cranning for two years. Aren't you getting tired of it? For sure. Of course I want to be in college as soon as I can. Then why not study harder? Yeah, well, he said, drawing the words out. If I could do that, I'd be doing it already. College is a drag, I said. I was totally disappointed once I got in. But not getting in would be even more of a drag. Fair enough, Kitaro said. I've got no comeback for that. So why don't you study? Lack of motivation, he said. Motivation, I said. Shouldn't be able to go out on dates with your girlfriend be good motivation? There was a girl Kitaro had known since they were in elementary school together. A childhood girlfriend, you could say. They had been in the same grade in school. But unlike him, she got into Sofia University straight out of high school. She was now majoring in French literature and had joined the tennis club. He showed me a photograph of her, and she was stunning, a beautiful figure and a lively expression. But the two of them weren't seeing each other much these days. They talked it over and decided that it was better not to date until Kitaru had passed the entrance exams so, he could, so that he could focus on his studies. Kitaru had been the one who suggested this. Okay, she said. If that's what you want. They talked on the phone a lot, but met at most once a week. And those meetings were more like interviews than regular dates. They'd have tea and catch up on what they'd been each been doing. They'd hold hands and exchange a brief kiss. But that was as far as it went. Kitaro wasn't what you call handsome, but he was pleasant looking enough. He was slim, and his hair and clothes were simple and stylish. As long as he didn't say anything, you assumed he was sensitive well brought up city boy. His only possible defect was that his face, a bit too slender and delicate, could give the impression that he was lacking in personality or was wishy-washy. But the moment he opened his mouth, this overall positive effect collapsed like a sandcastle under an exuberant Lavador retriever. People were dismayed by his constant dialect, which he delivered, as if that weren't enough, in a slightly piercing, high-pitched tone. The mismatch with his looks was overwhelming. Even for me, it was, at least, a little too much to handle at first. Hey, Tanimura, aren't you lonely without a girlfriend? Kitaro asked me the next day. I don't deny it, I told him. Then how about you go out with my girl? I couldn't understand what he meant. What do you mean, go out with her? She's a great girl, pretty honest smart like get out you go out with her you won't regret it i guarantee it i'm sure i wouldn't i said but why would i go out with your girlfriend it doesn't make sense because you're a good guy kitaro said otherwise i wouldn't suggest it erica and i have spent almost all our lives together so far we sort of naturally become a couple and everybody around us approved our friends our parents our teachers a tight little couple always together kitaro clasped his hands to illustrate If we both gone straight into college, our lives would have been all warm and fuzzy, but I blew the entrance exam big time and here we are. I'm not sure why exactly, but things kept on getting worse. I'm not blaming anyone for that. It's all my fault. I listened to him in silence. 
So I kind of split myself in two, Hitaru said. He pulled his hands apart. How so? I asked. He stared at, my ha at his palms for a moment, then, then spoke. What I mean is, part of me is, like, worried, you know? I mean, I'm going to some freaking cram school, studying for the freaking exams, entrance exams, while Erica's having a ball in college, playing tennis, doing whatever. She's got new friends, she's probably seem to be dating some new guy, for all I know. When I think of all that, I feel left behind. Like my mind's in a fog. You know what I mean? I guess so, I said. But another part of me is, like, relieved. If we just kept going where, like, we were, we, with no problems or anything, a nice couple smoothly sailing through life, it's like we graduate from college, get married, or this wonderful married couple everyone's happy about where we have the typical two kids, put them in the good old Denichofu Elementary School, go out to the Tama River Banks on Sundays. Oop la di, oop la da. I'm not saying that's kind of bad life, but I wonder, you know, if life should really be that easy, that comfortable. It might be better to go out our separate ways for a while. And if we ever find out that we really can't get along without each other, then we get back together. So you're saying that things being smooth and comfortable is a problem? Is that it? Yeah, that's about the size of it. But why do I have to go out with your girlfriend? I asked. I figure if she's going to go out with the other guys, it's better It's better if it's you. Because I know you. And you can give me like updates and stuff. That doesn't. That didn't make any sense to me. Though I admit I, would, I was interested in the idea of meeting Erica. I also wanted to find out why a beautiful girl like her would want to go out with a weird character like Hitaru. I've always been a little shy around new people, but I never lacked curiosity. How far have you gone with her? I asked. You mean sex? Kitaru said. Yeah. Have you gone all the way? Kitaru shook his head. I just couldn't, see? I've known her since she was a kid, and it's kind of embarrassing, you know? That, like, we're just starting out. To take her clothes off, fawn on her, touch her, whatever. If there were some other girl, I don't think I've had a problem. But putting my hands in her, my hand in her underpants, even just thinking about doing it with her, I don't. It just seems wrong, you know. I didn't. I can't explain it well, Kitaru said. Like when you're jerking off, you picture some actual girl, yeah. I suppose I said, but I can't picture Erica. It's like doing that's wrong, you know. So when I do it, I think about some other girl, somebody I don't really like that much. What do you think? I thought it over, but couldn't reach any conclusion. Other people's masturbation habits were beyond me. There were things about my own that I couldn't fathom. Anyway, let's all get together once, the three of us, Kitaru said. Then you can think it over. The three of us, me, Kitaru, and his girlfriend, whose full name was Erika Kuritani, met on a Sunday afternoon in a coffee shop near Denenchofu Station. She was almost as tall as Kitaru, nicely tanned, and decked out in a neatly ironed short sleeve white blouse and navy blue miniskirt, like the perfect model of a respectable uptown college girl. She was as attractive as in her photograph, but what really drew me in person was less her looks than the kind of effortless vitality that seemed to radiate from her. She was the opposite of Kitaru, who paled a bit in comparison. I'm really happy that Akitan has a friend, Erika told me. Kitaru's first name was Akiyoshi. She was the only person in the world who called him Akikun. Don't exaggerate. I got a ton of friends, Kitaru said. No, you don't, Erika said. A person like you can't make friends. You were born in Tokyo, yet all you speak is Kansai dialect. And every time you open your mouth, it's one annoying thing after another about the Hashin Tiger's or Shogi moves. There's no way a weird person like you can get along well with normal people. Well... If you're gonna get into that, this guy's pretty weird too, Kitaru pointed at me. He's from Ashia, but only speaks Tokyo dialect. That's much more common, Erika said. At least more common than the opposite. Hold on now. That's cultural discrimination, Kitaru said. Cultures are all equal, you know. Tokyo dialect's no better than Kansai. Maybe they are equal, Erika said. But since the Meiji Restoration, the way people speak speak in Tokyo has been the standard for spoken Japanese. I mean, hasn't anyone ever translated Franny and Zoe into Kensai dialect? If they did, I'd buy it for sure, Kitaru said. I probably would too, I thought, but kept quiet. Wisely, instead of being dragged deeper into that discussion, Erika Kuritani changed the subject. There's a girl in my tennis club who's from Aisha too, she said, turning to me. I call Sakuri. 
Do you happen to know her? I do, I said. Aiko Sakuri was a tall, gangly girl whose parents operated a large golf course, stuck up, flat-chested, with a funny-looking nose and a none-too-wonderful personality. Tennis was the one thing she's always been good at. I never saw her again. It would be too soon for me. He's a nice guy, and he hasn't got a girlfriend right now, Kitaru said to Erika. His looks are okay. He has good manners, and he knows all kinds of things. He's neat and clean, as you can see, and doesn't have any terrible diseases. A promising young man, I say. All right, Erika said. There are some really cute new members of our club I'd be happy to introduce him to. Nah, that's not what I mean, Kitaro said. Could you go out with him? I'm not in college yet, and I can't go out with the way you I like to. Instead of me, you could go out with him, and then I wouldn't have to worry. What do you mean you don't have to worry? Erika asked. I mean, like, I know both of you, and I'd feel better if you went out with him instead of some guy I've never laid eyes on. Erika stared at Kitaru as if she couldn't quite believe what she was seeing. Finally, she spoke. So you're saying it's okay for me to go out with another guy if it's Tami Murakun here? You're seriously suggesting we go out on a date? Hey, it's not such a terrible idea, is it? Or are you going out with some other guy? No, there's no one else, Erika said in a quiet voice. Then why not go out with him? It could kind of be a cultural exchange. Cultural exchange, Erika repeated. She looked at me. It didn't seem as though anything I said would help, so I kept silent. I held my coffee spoon in my hand, studying the design on it like a museum curator, scrutinizing an artifact from an Egyptian tomb. Cultural exchange? What's that supposed to mean? She asked Kitaru. Like, bringing in another viewpoint might not be so bad for us. That's your idea of cultural exchange? Yeah, what I mean is... Alright. Erika, Kuritani said firmly. If there had been a pencil nearby, I might have picked it up and snapped it in two. If you think we should do it, Akikun, then okay, let's do a cultural exchange. She took a sip of tea, returned the cup to the saucer, turned to me, and smiled. Since Akikun has recommended we do this, Tani Murakun, let's go on a date. Sounds like fun. When are you free? I couldn't speak. Not being able to find the right words at the crucial times is one of my many problems. Erika took a red letter planner from her bag, opened it, and checked her schedule. How's this sun Saturday? I have no plans, I said. Saturday it is, then. Where shall we go? He likes movies, Kitaro told her. His dream is to write screenplays someday. Then let's go see a movie. What kind of movie should we see? I'll let you decide that, Tem Tani Murakun. I don't like horror films, but other than that, anything's fine. She's a real scaredy cat, Kitaro said to me. When we were kids and went to the haunted house at Korakun, she had to hold my hand and... After the movie, let's have a nice meal together, Erika said, cutting him off. She wrote her phone number down on a sheet from a notebook and passed it to me. When you decide the time and place, could you give me a call? I didn't have a phone back then. This was long before cell phones were even a glimmer on the horizon. So I gave her the number for the coffee shop where Kitaro and I worked. I glanced at my watch. I'm sorry, but I've got to get going. I said, as cheerfully as I could manage. I have this report I have to finish up by tomorrow. Can't I wait? Kitaru asked. We, just, we only just got here. Why don't you stay so we can talk some more? That's a great noodle shop right around the corner. Eric uh, didn't express an opinion. I put the money from my coffee on the table and stood up. It's an important report, I explained, so I can't really pull it off. Actually, it didn't matter all that much. I'll call you tomorrow or the day after. I told Erica. I'll be looking forward to it, she said, a wonderful smile rising to her lips, a smile that, to me at least, seemed a little too good to be true. I left the coffee shop, and as I walked to the station, I wondered what the hell I was doing. Brooding over how things had turned out, even after everything had been decided, was another of my chronic problems. That Saturday, Erica and I met in Shibuya, and saw a Woody Allen film set in New York. Somehow I got the sense that she might be fond of Woody Allen movies, and I was pretty sure that Hitaru had never taken her to see one. Luckily, it was a good movie, and we were both feeling cheerful when we left the theater. We strolled around the twilight streets for a while, then went to a small Italian place in Sakuragaka and had pizza and chianti. 
It was a casual, moderately priced restaurant. Subdued lighting, candles on the tables. Most Italian restaurants at the time had candles on the tables and checked gingham tablecloths. We talked about all kinds of things, the sort of conversation you'd expect two college sophomores on a first date to have, assuming you could actually call this a date. The movie we'd just seen, our college life, hobbies. We enjoyed talking more than I'd expected, and she even laughed out loud a couple of times. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I seem to have a knack for getting girls to laugh. I heard from Aki-kun that you broke up with your high school girlfriend not long ago? Erica asked me. Yeah, I replied. We went out for almost three years, but it didn't work out, unfortunately. Aki-kun said things didn't work out with her because of sex. That she didn't, how should I put it, give you what you wanted? That was part of it, but not all. If I really loved her, I think I could have been patient. If I'd been sure that I loved her, I mean, but I wasn't. Erica nodded. Even if we'd gone all the way, things most likely would have ended up the same, I said. I think it was inevitable. Is that hard on you? She asked. Is what hard? Suddenly be on your own after being a couple. Sometimes, I said honestly. But maybe going through that kind of tough, lonely experience is necessary when you're young. Part of the process of growing up? You think so? The way surviving hard winters makes the tree grow stronger, the growth rings inside it tighter. I tried to imagine growth rings inside me, but the only thing I could picture was a leftover slice of bakukuchin cake, the kind with tree-like rings inside it. I agree that people need that sort of period in their lives, I said. It's even better if they know that it'll end someday. She smiled. Don't worry, I know you'll meet somebody nice some soon. I hope so, I said. Erica mulled over something while I helped myself to the pizza. Tanimura-kun, I wanted to ask your advice on something. Is it okay? Sure, I said. This was another problem I often had to deal with. People I'd just met wanting my advice about something important. And I was pretty sure that what Erica wanted my advice about wasn't very pleasant. I'm confused, she began. Her eyes shifted back and forth like those of a cat in search of something. I'm sure you know this already, but through Akikin's in his second year of cramming for the entrance exams, he barely studies. He skips exam prep school a lot, too, so I'm sure he'll fail again next year. If he aimed for a lower tier school, he could get in somewhere, but he has his heart set on Wasida. He doesn't listen to me or his parents. It's become like an obsession for him. But if he really feels that way, he should study hard so that he can pass the Wasida exam, and he doesn't. Why doesn't he study more? He truly believes that he'll pass the exam if luck is on his side, Erica said. That studying is a waste of time. She sighed and went on. In elementary school, he was always at the top of his class academically, but once he got to junior high, his grades started to slide. He was a bit of a child prodigy. His personality just isn't suited to the daily grinding of study, studying. He'd rather go off and do crazy things on his own. I'm the exact opposite. I'm not all that bright, but I always buckle down and get the job done. I hadn't studied very hard myself and had got into college on the first try. Maybe luck had been on my side. I'm very fond of Aki-kun, she continued. He's got a lot of wonderful qualities, but sometimes it's hard for me to grow along with his extreme way of thinking. Take this thing with Kansai dialect. Why does someone who was born and raised in Tokyo go to the trouble of learning Kansai dialect and speak all the time? I don't get it. I really don't. At first I thought it was a joke, but it isn't. He's dead serious. I think he wants to have a different personality, to be somebody different from who he's been up till now, I said. That's why he only speaks Kansai dialect? I agree with you that it's a radical way of dealing with it. Erica picked up a slice of pizza and bit off a piece the size of a large postage stamp. She chewed it through thoughtfully before she spoke. Tanimura-kun, I'm asking this because I don't have anyone else to ask. You don't mind? Of course not, I said. What else could I say? As a general rule, she said, when a guy and a girl go out for a long time and get to know each other really well, the guy has a physical interest in the girl, right? As a general rule, 
I'd say so, yes. If they kiss, he'll want to go further? Normally, sure. You feel that way too? Of course, I said. But Aki-kun doesn't. When we're alone, he doesn't want to go any further. It took a while for me to choose the right words. That's a personal thing, I said finally. People have different ways of getting what they want. Kitaro likes you a lot, that's a given. But your relationship is so close and comfortable, he might not be able to take things to the next level. The way most people do. You really think so? I shook my head. To tell the truth, I really don't understand it. I've never experienced it myself. I'm just saying that could be one of the possibilities. Sometimes I feel like he doesn't have any sexual desire for me. I'm sure he does, but it might be a little embarrassing for him to admit it. But we're 20, adults already, old enough to not be embarrassed. Some people might mature a little faster than others, I said. Erica thought about this. She seemed to be the type who always tackles things head on. I think Itaro is honestly seeking something, I went on, in its own way, at his own pace. It's just that I don't think he's grasped yet what it is. That's why he can't make any progress. If you don't know what you're looking for, it's not that easy to look for it. Erica raised her hand and stared at me in the eye. The candle of flame was reflected in her dark eyes, a small, brilliant point of light. It was so beautiful I had to look away. Of course, you know him much better than I do, I averred. She sighed again. Actually, I'm seeing another guy besides Aki-kun, she said. A boy in my tennis club who's a year ahead of me. It was my turn to remain silent. I truly love Aki-kun, and I don't think I could ever feel the same way about anybody else. Whenever I'm away from him, I get this terrible ache in my chest, always in the same spot. It's true. There's a place in my heart reserved just for him, but at the same time I have this strong urge inside of me to try something else, to come into contact with all kinds of people. Call it curiosity, a thirst to know more. It's a natural emotion and I can't suppress it, no matter how much I try. I pictured a healthy plant outgrowing the pot I had been planted in. When I say I'm confused, that's what I mean, Erika said. Then you should tell Kitaro exactly how you feel, I said. If you hide it from him then you're see that you're seeing someone else and he happens to find out anyway, it'll hurt him. You don't want that. But can he accept that? The fact that I'm going out with someone else? I imagine he'll understand how you feel, I said. You think so? I do, I said. I figured that Kitaro would understand her confusion because he was feeling the same thing. In that sense, they, were, they really were on the same wavelength. Still, I wasn't entirely confident that he would calmly accept what she was actually doing, or might be doing. He didn't seem that strong a person to me. But it would be even harder for him if she kept the secret from him, or lied to him. Erica stared at the candle flame flickering the breeze from the AC. I often have the same dream, she said. Aki and I are on a ship. A long journey on a large ship. We're together in a small cabin, it's late at night, and through the porthole we can see the full moon. But that moon is made of pure, transparent ice, and the bottom half of it is sunk in the sea. That looks like the moon, Akikun tells me, but it's really made of ice and is only about 8 inches thick. So when the sun comes out in the morning, it all melts. You should get a look, good look at it now, while you have the chance. I've had this dream so many times, it's a beautiful dream. Always the same moon, always eight inches thick. I'm leaning against Akikun. It's just the two of us, the waves lapping gently outside. But every time I wake up, I feel unbearably sad. Erika Kuritani was silent for a time. Then she spoke again. I think how wonderful it would be if Akikun and I could continue on that voyage forever. Every night we snuggle close and gaze out on the porthole at that moon made of ice. Come morning, the moon would melt away, and at night it would reappear. But that's not the case. Maybe one night the moon wouldn't be there. It scares me to think that. I get so frightened it's like I can actually feel my body shrinking. When I saw Kitaro at the coffee shop the next day, he asked me how I felt the day had gone. You kiss her? No way, I said. Don't worry, I'm not going to freak out if you did, he said. I didn't do anything like that. Didn't hold her hand? No. I didn't hold her hand. So what'd you do? We went to see a movie, took a walk, 
had dinner, and talked. I said, that's it? Usually you don't try to move too fast on the first date. Really? Kitaro said. I've never been out on a regular date, so I don't know. But I joined being with her. If she were my girlfriend, I never let her out of my sight. Kitaro considered this. He was about to say something, but thought better of it. So what'd you eat? He asked finally. I told him about the pizza and the chianti. Pizza and chianti? He sounded surprised. I never knew she liked pizza. We've only been to like noodle shops and cheap diners. Wine? I didn't know she could drink. Kitaro never touched liquor himself. There are probably quite a few things you don't know about her, I said. I answered all of his questions about the date, about the Woody Allen film. At his insistence, I reviewed the whole plot. The meal, how much the bill came to, whether we split it or not, what she had on, white cotton dress, hair pinned up, what kind of underwear she wore, how would I know that, what we talked about. I said nothing about her going out with another guy, nor did I mention her dreams of an icy moon. You guys decide when you will have a second date? No, we didn't, I said. Why not? You liked her, didn't you? She's great, but we can't go on like this. I mean, she's your girlfriend, right? You say it's okay to kiss her, but there's no way I could do that. More pondering by Kitaru. You know something? He said finally. I've been seeing a the therapist since the end of junior high. The parents and teachers, they said they all said to go to one. Because I used to do things at school from time to time, you know? Not normal kind of things. But going to the therapist hadn't helped, as far as I can see. It sounds good in theory, but therapists don't give a crap. They look at you like they know what's going on. They make you talk on and on and just listen. Man, I could do that. You're still seeing a therapist? Yeah, twice a month. Like throwing your money away, if you ask me. Erica didn't tell you about it? I shook my head. To tell you the truth, I didn't know what's so weird about my ways of thinking. To me, it seems like I'm just doing ordinary things in an ordinary way. But people tell me that almost everything I do is weird. Well, there are some things about you that are definitely not normal. Like what? Like your Kansai dialect. You could be right, Kitaro admitted. That's a little out of the ordinary. Normal people wouldn't take things that far. Yeah, you're probably right. But as far as I can tell, even if what you do isn't normal, it's not bothering anybody. Not right now. So what's wrong with that? I said. I might have been a little upset then, at what or whom I couldn't say. I could feel my tongue getting rougher around the edges. If not, if you're not bothering anybody, then so what? You want to speak inside dialect? Then you should. Go for it. You don't want to study for the entrance exam? Then don't. Don't feel like sticking your hand inside Erica Kuritani's panties? Who's saying you have to? It's your life. You should do what you want and forget what other people think. Kitaru, mouth slightly open, stared at me in amazement. You know something, Tanimura? You're a good guy, though sometimes a little too normal, you know? What are you going to do? I said. You can't just change your personality. Exactly. You can't change your personality. That's what I'm trying to say. But Erica's a great girl, I said. She really cares about you. Whatever you do, don't let her go. You'll never find such a great girl again. I know. You don't gotta tell me, Gitaro said. But just knowing isn't gonna help. About two weeks later, Gitaro quit working at the coffee shop. I say quit, but he just suddenly stopped showing up. He didn't get in touch. They didn't mention anybody about taking time off. And this was during our busiest season, so the owner was pretty pissed. Kitaro was owed a week's pay, but he didn't come to pick it up. He simply vanished. I have to say it hurt me. I thought we were good friends, and it was tough to be cut off so completely like that. I didn't have any other friends in Tokyo. The last two days before he disappeared, Kitaro was unusually quiet. He wouldn't say much when I talked to him, and then he went and vanished. I could have called Erika Kuritani to check where on his whereabouts, but somehow I couldn't bring myself to. I figured that what went on between the two of them was their business, and that it wasn't a healthy thing for me to get any more involved than I was. Somehow I had to get by in the narrow little world I belonged to. After all this happened, for some reason I kept thinking about my ex-girlfriend. Probably I had felt something, seeing Kitaru and Erika together. I wrote her a long letter apologizing for how I'd behaved. I could have been a whole lot kinder to her, but I never got a reply. 
I recognized Erika Kunitai right away. I had only seen her twice, and 16 years had passed since then. But there was no mistaking her. She was still lovely, with the same lively, animated expression. She was wearing a black lace dress with black high heels and two strands of pearls around her slim neck. She remembered me right away. We were at a wine tasting party at a hotel in Akasaka. It was a black tie event, and I put on a dark suit and tie for the occasion. He was a rep for the advertising firm that was sponsoring the event, and was clearly doing a great job of handling it. It took too long to get into the reasons that I was there. Tani Murakan, how come you never got in touch with me after that night we went out? She asked. I was hoping we could talk some more. You were a little too beautiful for me, I said. She smiled. That's nice to hear, even if you're flattering me. But what I said was neither a fly nor flattery. She was too gorgeous for me to be seriously interested in her. Back then, and even now. I called that coffee shop you used to work at, but they said you didn't work there anymore she said. After Kitaru left, the job became a total bore, and I quit two weeks later. Erica and I briefly reviewed the lives we led over the past 16 years. After college, I was hired by a small publisher, but quit after three years and have been a writer ever since. I got married at 27, but didn't have any children yet. Erica was still single. They drive me so hard at work, she joked, that I have no time to get married. She was the first one to bring up the topic of Kitaru. Aki-kun's working as a sushi chef in Denver now, she said. Denver? Denver, Colorado. At least according to the postcard he sent me a couple months ago. Why Denver? I don't know, Erica said. The postcard before that was from Seattle. He was a sushi chef there, too. That was about a year ago. He sends me postcards sporadically. Always some silly card with just a couple of lines dashed off. Sometimes he doesn't even write his return address. A sushi chef, I mused. So she, he never did go to college. She shook her head. At the end of that summer, I think it was, he suddenly announced that he'd had, had it with studying for the entrance exam. He went off to a cooking school in Osaka. Said he really wanted to learn Kansai cuisine and go to games at Koenshin Stadium, the Hashin Tiger Stadium. Of course, I asked him, how can you decide something so important without even asking me? What about me? And what did he say to that? She didn't respond. She just held her lips tight, as if she'd break into tears if she tried to speak. I quickly changed the subject. When we went to that Italian restaurant in Shibuya, I remember we had cheap chianti. Now look at us. Tasted premium Napa wines. Kind of a strange twist of fate. I remember, she said, pulling herself together. We saw a Woody Allen movie. Which one was it again? I told her. That was a great movie. I agreed. It was definitely one of Woody Allen's masterpieces. Did things work out with that guy in your tennis club you were seeing? I asked. She shook her head. No, we just didn't connect the way I thought we would. We went out for six months and then broke up. Can I ask you a question? I said. It's very personal though. Of course. I don't want you to be offended. I'll do my best. You slept with that guy, right? Erica looked at me in surprise, her cheeks reddening. Why are you bringing that up now? Good question, I said. It's just been on my mind for a long time, but that was a weird thing to ask. I'm sorry. Erica shook her head slightly. No, it's okay. I'm not offended. I just wasn't expecting it. It was also long ago. I looked around the room. People in formal wear were scattered about. Corpse popped one after another from expensive bottles of wine. A female pianist was playing like someone in love. The answer is yes, Erica said. I had sex with him a number of times. Curiosity, a thirst to know more, I said. She gave a hint of smile. That's right, curiosity, a thirst to know more. That's how we develop our growth rings. If you say so, she said. And I'm guessing that the first time you slept with him was soon after we had our first date in Shibuya. She turned a page in her mentor, mental record book. I think so. About a week after that. I remember the whole time pretty well. It was the first time for me. And Gitaro was pretty quick on the uptake, I said, gazing into her eyes. She looked down and fingered her, the pearls on her necklace one by one. 
as if making sure that they were all still there. She gave a small sign, perhaps remembering something. Yes, you're right about that. Agikun had a very strong sense of intuition, but it didn't work out with the other man. She nodded. Unfortunately, I'm just not that smart. I needed to take the long way around. I always take a roundabout way. That's what we all do, endlessly, endlessly taking the long way around. I wanted to tell her this, but kept silent. Blurting out aphorism like that was another one of my problems. Is Kitaru married? As far as I know, he's still single, Erika said. At least, he hadn't told me that he got married. Maybe the two of us are the type who never make a go of marriage. Or maybe you're just taking a roundabout way of getting there. Perhaps. Do you still dream about the moon made of ice? I asked. Her head snapped up and she stared at me. Very calmly, slowly, a smile spread across her face. A completely natural, open smile. You remember my dream? She asked. For some reason, I do. Even though it's someone else's dream? Dreams are the kind of things you can borrow and lend out. I said. That's a wonderful idea. She said. Someone called her name from behind me. It was time for her to get back to work. I don't have that dream anymore, she said, in parting, but I still remember every detail. What I saw, the way I felt, I can't forget it. I probably never will. When I'm driving and the Beatles song Yesterday comes on the radio, I can't help but hear those crazy lyrics Kitaru Kroon in the bath, and I regret not writing them down. The lyrics were so weird that I remembered them for a while, but gradually my memory started to fade until finally I had nearly forgotten them. All I recall now are fragments, and I'm not sure, even sure if they are actually what Kitaru sang. As time passes, memory inevitably reconstitutes itself. When I was 20 or so, I tried several times to keep a diary, but I just couldn't do it. So many things were happening around me back then that I could barely keep up with them. Let alone stand still and write them all down in a notebook. And most of these things were, weren't the kind of thing that made me think. Oh, I've got to write this down. It was all I could do to open my eyes in the strong headwind, catch my breath, and forge ahead. But, oddly enough, I remember Kitaru so well. We were friends for just a few months. Yet every time I hear yesterday scenes and conversations with him well up in my mind, the two of us talking while he was soaked in the tub at his home in Denichofu, talking about the Hashin Tigers' bat batting order, how troublesome certain aspects of sex could be, how mind-numbingly -num boring it was to study for the entrance exams, how emotionally rich Kansai dialect was. And I remember the strange date with Erika Kuritani, and what Erika, over the candlelit table at the Italian restaurant, confessed. It feels as though these things happened just yesterday. Music has that power to revive memories, sometimes so intensely that they hurt. But um, when I look back at myself at age 20, what I remember most is being alone and lonely. I had no girlfriend to warm my body or soul, no friends I could open up to, no clue what I should do every day, no vision for the future. For the most part, I remained hidden away, deep within myself. Sunlight, sometimes I'd go a week without talking to anybody. That kind of life continued for a year. A long, long year. Whether this period was a cold winter that left valuable growth rings inside me, I can't really say. At the time, I felt as if every night I, too, were gazing out of a porthole at a moon made of ice. A tr transparent, eight-inch thick frozen moon. But I watched that moon alone, unable to share its cold beauty with anyone.